Good afternoon. I was an EIS officer in 1978 who followed Steve Thacker in Washington, D.C. One evening I got a phone call from Lyle Conrad, who was the head of field services, and he said, would you like to go to Bahrain on an outbreak investigation? I said, absolutely. Oh boy, sure. Where's Bahrain? <laughs> you see, because international outbreak investigations back in the day were a lot like combat missions for the military. And like combat missions, they weren't always open to women. Indeed, Bahrain is an island of 300,000 people, and we already had an officer on site, Bob Gunn, who'd been looking at this outbreak of 913 cholera cases. But he couldn't talk to women. In fact, the society was so conservative, he couldn't go in the houses, do interviews, or do the questionnaire. So I jumped on a plane, and after many hours, when the doors slid open in the Bahraini airport, I realized immediately I was completely wrongly dressed in my pink Levi's and my leather fringe jacket. <laughs> As I looked out and I saw circles of men in traditional dobes and headdresses seated on the floor playing dice, who looked at me and followed me as I crossed the arrivals hall. When I found Bob at the Dillman Hotel, finally, he said, oh, I thought you were coming tomorrow. So we had an outbreak, and the unusual piece of this outbreak was that in the 913 cases, many were in infants under the age of one, 85 per 10,000. And so we needed to do a case control study and find out why we had this very high rate in women. So we designed the study, we designed a questionnaire, we spent hours, oh, and I got a team. Because this was Bob's team, which had already described the outbreak, found a relatively high attack rate among men who ventured outside the household. Uh, but they couldn't do the next step. So I had a team too, but they refused to have their picture taken. I found Mrs. Baker, who was the head of public health nurses, and we had a team of about 20 public health nurses who were so shy, you only see Dr. Matthews in this picture with me. So we went from house to house. Our cases were cases of infant cholera. Our controls were from cholera households where the infants hadn't gotten sick. Bahrain had good water from desalinization and deep wells, but it had no sanitation whatsoever. So our hypothesis was that something in water handling, which was actually the vehicle of the overall outbreak, was affecting the infants. And our hypothesis was that the way the infants were being fed was integral to that. This is me and the team going in for an interview. This is where all food preparation was done in these households, out in the courtyard, with very poor sanitation. And this is a bottle. And what we found with this, called in Arabic, a bazooza, was that after we did our case control study and sat up very late one night using our Hewlett Packard 50 programmable calculators <laughs> with papers all over the room, that we had a, a case control study that absolutely pinpointed the problem. And it was the incursion of bottle feeding and infant formula into a traditional society without any education or sanitation around it. We were ecstatic. Our work was done, except it wasn't. I got a telex from CDC asking me to collect mother's milk. Now, breasts don't come with a user manual. I had no idea, no idea. But I was the girl, and so in a panic, I went to Mrs. Baker and my public health nurses, and within a couple of days, we had a dozen samples. We put on dry ice and shipped to CDC, and I believe you'll find them somewhere in Clifton in a sub-zero freezer even today. <laughs> and then we got our orders. Bob was ordered to go and present our findings to MRO in Alexandria, 
and to headquarters of WHO in Geneva. I was ordered back to the United States. I felt like I got hit in the gut. So I screwed up all my courage because I knew that evening at the Dillman Hotel, the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office was having a reception and the regional director was gonna be there. So I walked up to Dr. Taha, I explained our findings. I said how pleased I was going to be to present them to him with my partner, Bob Gunn. <laughs> and he immediately invited me to Alexandria and I immediately tell like CDC, and immediately my orders were changed. Don't try this at home. <laughs> After a number of papers published in The Lancet, in fact, this outbreak investigation was critical to getting a new breast milk marketing code through WHO. And one of our partners in that was Dr. Baruya in WHO headquarters, who was initially very skeptical of case control studies. But working together, Bob and I were able to find a negotiation space, excuse me, <clears throat> and he became a strong ally. We never would have gotten this code without working together. Nothing is forever, this happened last June, but more information will come. I was delighted to be invited back to Bahrain a few months later through the auspices of Gene Gangarosa to do a full evaluation of their infectious disease surveillance system. And while I was there, the public health nurses came to me with a new outbreak problem. Well, they didn't really know what it was. Little boys in a village were turning into little girls. They were developing breasts. In this culture, this was shameful. There were many superstitions and the mothers were panicked. So we immediately went to the village and started to examine the little boys, all of whom were under six, and many of whom had some pronounced breast development. So we did a case control study, asked them about milk and food and meat, and we were getting nowhere. Our cases were breast development, our controls were little boys without breast development, until after a few days, a mother very shyly came in to see me. Her little boy, who was four, had been hidden for the last six months. His name was Faisal Jamil. And when I examined him, he had very pronounced breast development. And I asked her about milk, and she said, oh yes, it all comes from our cow. Uh, our cow has been getting shots. And in fact, as it turns out, the cow was getting estrogen shots, and our hypothesis was that the active hormone was going into the cow's milk. And when we went back and re-interviewed, we found an odds ratio of 60 for exposure to this one animal's milk. So AUB sent a team of veterinarians out in the best One Health tradition, which we didn't have then, <clears throat> but the cow had an unfortunate accident, and we couldn't find the cow. In fact, it had been slaughtered. Many, many months later, in fact, two years later, I was back in Bahrain to teach a WHO course. And in the course of that, at six and a half months pregnant, I had an abrupted placenta, a hemorrhage, and I was in desperate shape with premature labor, multiple transfusions, thinking I was going to lose my first child, if not my life. And my friends and colleagues from the Ministry of Health and my nurses came with flowers and with prayers. And I think the prayers worked because my daughter just got her PhD. But what I want to emphasize about this outbreak, thank you, is that when we do our work internationally, we need to bring our heart as well as our head. We need to bring trust forward and the only way to do that in cultures such as these, which are very different than our own, is to respect the culture. And especially at this time when we have lots of high rhetoric around cultures, Islamic cultures, traditional Arab cultures, it's important to really understand. In the interest of global public health, we need that trust. And the only way that mother was willing to show me her hidden son, which solved the problem, was because Bob and I had developed trust, and then I had developed trust with the nurses, 
and we were able to use that trust. The other point I want to make is that women, such as these, have been part of the EIS for decades. But often we got those orders, and sometimes we weren't in the picture. So I wanted to put a few women in the picture from my era. And also, we didn't have lactation keys. <laughs> so things have changed a lot in the EIS. And this is the EIS class of last year. So we are definitely making progress. But integral to trust, integral to working with communities, is that collaboration and equal partnership between male and female officers and respect for one another professionally and what we can bring to our contributions in global public health. Thank you.